Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. So that brings us to our third and final speaker, Greg Whitmore. Uh, Whitmore, sorry. Uh, Greg Wetmore is the Vice President of Product Development at Entrust, where he leads the global team responsible for building the products that make up Entrust strong identities, secure payments, and trusted infrastructure solutions. Greg is a key industry advisor and speaks regularly on topics such as digital identity, IoT, and post-quantum security. Uh, Greg holds an en engineering degree from Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, and today he will uh, tell us all about uh, PKI deployments. Please welcome Greg to the stage. Thank you so much, Thomas, for the introduction. Very much appreciated. Uh, I think it's probably fitting that we sort of finish this conference with a presentation that has a bit of a PKI spin to it. After all, we're at the PKI Consortium event. Um, so I want to talk to you today a little bit about this concept that you've heard from many of the speakers this week who talked about how complex this transition from where we are today to quantum safe is going to be. Um, and certainly when you think about PKI or certificate enabled applications, we've done some of this before. Um, we've extended RSA key lengths, we've deployed elliptic curve CAs alongside our established RSA PKIs, um, we've changed hash functions. But all of that looks pretty easy compared to the transition to, to post-quantum. We've never really had to face a wholesale transition to a completely brand new crypto system under this threat of sort of a total loss of security in our existing systems. And so that's a, a bit of an in intimidating um, challenge to overcome. So um, there's perhaps not a security technology that's more widely deployed in our digital worlds than X509 and, and PKI-based certificates. Um, there are literally dozens of RFCs that have dependencies uh, on, on certificates. It really is this trusted infrastructure that supports our connected digital lives today on the internet. Um, and that's just the beginning when you think of ITUT and Wi-Fi Alliance and GSMA and, and wi um, e, uh, sorry, EMV, we just heard today from the payments industry, there's just countless cryptographic messaging formats and protocols that are dependent on PKI. The other thing I'm trying to illustrate here with this picture is this difference between sort of very core, extremely common certificate use cases. Almost every company probably has web SSL certificates on their, or SSL certificates on their web servers. Almost every organization probably has some certificates on their Wi-Fi access points. But you very quickly tail off into much more specialized uses of PKI. Um, you know, vertical specific applications, um, less commonly deployed applications, all the way down to sort of custom built applications that have embedded PKI technology. Um, and so when, as we consider migration to quantum safe, I think it's a sort of useful distinction to figure out, are we sort of, or are, is your application for PKI sort of on the left of this picture in that common case? And, and if you're in that common case, can we perhaps assume or hope that the platform providers, uh, the operating systems, the cloud platform providers, the web browsers are going to offer sort of fairly easy migration paths? Or do we fit more on the right side of the slide where we really ha do have to consider you know, tools and techniques and capabilities that will help us with this post-quantum migration? So that's where I'm going to uh, sort of the, th the thesis for my discussion today really is about how do you classify where you are on this spectrum? Um, what are the questions you should be asking? Or how do we identify the requirements for a, a PKI-enabled application that sort of points us towards, I'm perhaps in this, these, this common category and can hope for a fairly easy path? Or am I in this more specialized category and really need to plan carefully and perhaps apply some innovative techniques and tools? Um, and then we're I'm going to dive into a little bit of those, what those tools look like and, and how they're progressing, the development we're undertaking as an industry today to help migration uh, towards quantum safe. So here are some sort of basic um, 
concepts to help us classify into common. Um, you know, if, if you can reach all of your client devices, um, if you're using standards-based protocols, perhaps you fit into this category of um, you know, fairly easy path, where my platform will provide me a path to uh, quantum safe, and I don't have to work as an organization particularly hard. But real life sure creeps in quickly, even in this category, um, when you have to consider legacy devices on your networks. Um, you perhaps have to consider that you can't update all devices at once. Um, you, or you don't, you have, don't have that visibility into um, where your cryptographic keys and certificates are in your uh, ecosystem. So perhaps this is the easy part, and even then sort of real life creeps in. In the specialized case, um, you know, we just, just mentioned PKI really extends everywhere into smart devices, the worlds of IoT, roots of trust, device identity, firmware integrity, um, we, we've heard today about embedded environments. We heard from NXP, we heard from the payment card industry where you know, constrained devices are really challenging to think about in a post-quantum space. Uh, and we have this sort of huge tale of interesting PKI applications, extremely short lifetime, single use certificates, um, session-based, file-based, uh, high assurance environments. Um, and so the, the takeaway for me, from me for this kind of Diversity really is, there isn't one recipe, there isn't a standard best practice that we can likely apply in these specialized cases that will help us sort of migrate by pushing an easy button. Just gonna switch gears a little bit and, and present some questions, some um, the questions you can ask at, at your organization to help identify where are my problems gonna lie and what kind of tools and techniques should I think about in a situation where I'm attempting a migration to quantum safe? Um, I called this the million dollar question, sort of, am I, do I fit into this core and common category or I do, do I have more of a specialized um, use case? And so some of those, those easy questions to ask uh, to sort of identify which category you fit in, that first one it really is about all right, am I using mostly standards-based negotiated protocols? Things like TLS have this great inbuilt capability to negotiate cryptographic agreement between a client and a server. Um, and there are other cases where negotiated protocols is really gonna help um, in a migration situation where servers can talk um, securely to legacy clients and updated clients at the same time. That second question, can I reach all my endpoints or devices? Is this a closed ecosystem where I control um, endpoints and I control server applications? That sure makes it easier when you're in that situation. Um, and you know, equally taking into account some of the timelines, we've heard um, many speakers this week talk about uh, you know, when organizations should start applying quantum safe technology. Um, and if you really look at something like the CNSA 2.0 guidelines. To me, this is an authoritative source of information. We've seen versions of this slide this week from a number of speakers. And CSNA is really asking for and compelling action immediately, um, looking for firmware and embedded uh, code signing to start happening immediately this year. Uh, and even our sort of common IT infrastructure, even over the next couple of years, looking for support for post-quantum. That timeline really does have to factor into your consideration about uh, how easy is this transition going to look. Some questions to ask um, that point you towards am I in more of that specialized or um, less common state where I need to re really think carefully about applying some of the new tools and diverse techniques for um, managing this transition to quantum safe. Uh, probably heard it 10 times this week, cryptographic inventory is a great starting point. Do you know where your cryptographic assets are, your keys, your certificates, your crypto libraries, your secrets? Um, really hard to fix something, fix a problem that you can't see. Um, do, do your applications have a direct cryptographic dependency? Have you built crypto directly into the applications that support your business? Or are you relying on a platform, your operating system, um, your, your cloud platform as a service to provide crypto primitives. Um, 
And what is your data sensitivity lifetime? Really that data inventory and identifying in your organization, where is that highly critical long life data set? And that question really helps you prioritize where to start. How does that data travel through my organization? What networks does it pass through? What applications are responsible for processing and protecting that data? And answering some of those questions really give you that roadmap for where to start. Switching from the sort of data towards the infrastructure. Some more questions that kind of point at specialized uh, or diverse use cases where um, some of our migration tools are gonna help uh, organizations make this transition. Again, reachability of your servers and your clients. Think about your hardware refresh li life cycle in your organization. Can you exploit that refresh, li refresh life cycle to get new hardware in place, whether that's endpoint hardware, connected devices, server hardware, HSM hardware? Um, what's the network topology and architecture look like in your organization? Are your is your highly sensitive data transitioning through internal networks or going over wide area network links or moving across the internet? Um, what kind of endpoint devices are storing or processing that highly sensitive information? So really taking a look and asking yourself questions about your infrastructure is gonna help you identify um, problem areas and requirements for a transition to quantum state. Last category of, of questions I think um, considers really the cryptographic requirements for your organization. Uh, and we've heard a number of speakers talk about some of the challenging areas uh, in post-quantum crypto, performance. Um, we've heard that from multiple speakers. Um, there's a, a huge diverse range of performance characteristics just in the NIST uh, post-quantum candidates, let alone some of the ones that sit around that um, that aren't on the standards track yet. Um, certainly we talk to customers who have a, a very high assurance need for protection mechanisms. And to those customers, we're potentially talking to them about some of the post-quantum or quantum safe algorithms that, that have the most scrutiny and have been around the longest um, to provide that higher level of protection in high assurance situations. Um, and of course, uh, with performance characteristics in your applications, you're considering bandwidth usage, memory usage, um, performance of signatures, performance of verification, encryption and decryption performance. All of those factor into um, your evaluation of, of what algorithms you're gonna pick when you're moving to a quantum safe PKI. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and then talk a little bit about some of the solutions that are in development today. Um, you know, you've sort of asked yourself a number of these questions considering your, uh, your data, considering your infrastructure, considering your cryptographic requirements. So now that you have some of those places where you have concerns or you've identified some requirements, what solutions, what tools and techniques do we have out there that can help you with that migration? Um, and I'm just really gonna scratch the surface here um, because as an industry, we're right in the middle. We're making the the sausage, so to speak, right now. We're right in the middle of development of some of these tools and techniques. Um, but I'm really encouraged that we have some really interesting capabilities to offer that I think will help organizations as they find some of those tough areas um, that they have to manage the migration to quantum safe. Um, so this is a, just a little summary of the tools I wanna talk about today. Um, it's not exhaustive, I suspect, over the next um, months and years. We'll start to develop more and more of these capabilities um, that help organizations figure out how to, how to do that migration. Um, I think one of the objectives I would have as an industry is that we move from sort of tools and techniques to recipes and best practices. You know, the world of post-quantum from a customer's lens can be pretty intimidating. Um, and I think we need to do better than just present them a whole bunch of options, a whole bunch of techniques and capabilities and instead be able to hold their hands, be able to tell them and show them in this situation for this use case, here's how you do it. Um, but gonna, gonna go over some of these tools and techniques that we're in the middle of building today. Um, there's certainly some pros and cons, some advantages and disadvantages of these different capabilities. Some offer interesting security properties, some offer interesting backwards compatibility um, properties, and so choosing 
this mix of tools and techniques are, are going to be what gets you through this uh, journey to quantum safe. So flag day. A flag day is what, what we talk about as that transition from current state, from pr exclusively classic or traditional public key cryptography to some version of quantum safe. And that flag day might be uh, a bit of a big bang, might be clients and servers all at once transitioning on a particular time, point in time to a version of quantum safe. Much more likely it's some version of soft flag day where um, organizations have started to deploy quantum safe capabilities, PQ certificates or hybrid certificates into their endpoints. They've stood up quantum safe PKI and they're slowly over time migrating a system or an ecosystem to quantum safe. We call that sort of a, s a soft flag day uh, plan. There's, you know, fortunately many um, cryptographic messaging formats and protocols are already set up to handle multiple signatures. Um, CMS is a great example of that. CMS is the probably the default standard cryptographic message that encapsulates signed and encrypted data at rest. Um, so things like SMIME are all built on this, uh, are all built on CMS. And already, this cryptographic messaging format can hold multiple signatures. And those multiple signatures might represent um, an RS, a signature with an RSA key, might represent also a signature with a quantum safe key. Um, different uh, you know, identities that have multiple certificates can produce these messages. Identities that are holding a hybrid certificate, so a certificate that has multiple keys in it, can produce these messages as well. Flipping back to one of those questions about uh, cryptographic requirements, um, we've, uh, I'm just sort of echoing what some of the other speakers have shared this week. We definitely have some of our customers talking to us about that high assurance need um, and still having some remaining questions about the security of, of lattice based schemes. I think, of, of course, as the months and years go by, that's going to diminish, hopefully. Um, uh, but luckily, we do have tools here, too. Um, we can talk to customers about the Sphinx Plus um, hash based quantum safe algorithms. We can talk to customers about Classic Nucleus, um, which again has that similar property of really having been around for a long time, having been well studied. Uh, and for the very most high assurance use cases for the places where data really lives the longest, um, we talk to our customers about some of these options, high assurance algorithms. Interesting aside, you know, as we're talking about classic McLeese, um, really large public keys. Um, Dustin just a few <laughs> minutes ago showed us some pictures of, of different algorithms that had that same characteristic, extremely large key sizes. We're building this mechanism. It sort of remains to be seen how useful it will be or where it will be applied. Um, but there's an IETF uh, draft RFC already in the works that allows for the externalization of a public key from a certificate. So really a certificate just holds a pointer to a public key and the hash of that key. And then that key can sit on a server somewhere and be retrieved over the network when it's needed. Um, you know, paired with caching a public key on an endpoint, um, this kind of scheme could help with the um, network bandwidth costs of um, you know, constantly having to transmit certificates to relying parties. Uh, this is a picture that looks a heck of a lot like the uh, BSI presentation earlier in the day. Uh, and I really think that this kind of a scheme is going to get used a fair amount as we're building PKI hierarchies. So building PKI hi hierarchies with mixed algorithm use. Uh, it helps us sort of target the correct algorithm for the correct use case, where perhaps root certificates that really need to have long 25 plus year lifetimes um, can be set up with something like Sphinx Plus that has that high assurance characteristic, well understood security properties. Perhaps intermediate CAs or other CAs in the hierarchy are set up with hybrid um, certificates and keys. And perhaps endpoints with the smallest uh, lifetime requirements can use the most efficient, smallest quantum safe algorithms that we have at our disposal, like the lithium or MLDSA. I've talked a, a few times about the concept of hybrid. 
hopefully at, the, at this point in the conference, at the end of the conference, this is a concept that you've been exposed to before. Um, this is something that we are um, hearing a lot from our customers about the interest and need for hybrid mechanisms. Uh, we heard from the uh, ANSSI and the BSI earlier in the conference about their advice, really, to um, uh, deploy post-quantum or quantum-safe cryptography in the next few years only in hybrid format. So what is a hybrid format? A hybrid format is where you're combining both a traditional public key cryptographic scheme with a quantum-safe one. And there are actually quite a number of different ways to do that. Some of those ways give you a security property where you are um, getting the protection from both the classic algorithm and the quantum safe one at the same time. Um, so, you know, breaking the security, whether that's compromising the integrity of a signature or compromising the confidentiality of an encrypted piece of data requires that you break both of the crypto systems, the traditional one and the quantum safe one. Uh, and in a world where we're adopting new crypto systems quickly, and we're not fully um, satisfied or fully um, uh, confident that this is the new system we're adopting is safe, and we're still in this place where we're pretty confident that a scaled quantum computer is not something that our, our adversaries have access to, that hybrid mechanism does provide you additional level of security. There are other hybrid mechanisms that offer backwards compatibility advantages, that potentially you can use one key or another uh, for instance, a legacy client could choose to use the key they understand how to operate with, the elliptic curve key or the RSA key, and updated clients can use one or both of the traditional key and the quantum safe key. So I'm gonna dig a little bit into the different hybrid mechanisms that we're building, we as an industry are building, uh, that are being worked on in places like ITF as we speak. Um, there's actually ITF going on in Prague this week, and hybrid mechanisms are part of that. Uh, that discussion this week. So composite is a uh, is a hybrid structure. I think that has the most uh, or, or offers the best security properties um, that a lot that really forces you to mix both uh, traditional crypto and quantum safe crypto at the same time. A composite certificate or a composite key is distinctly defined as a key or a certificate that contains multiple key components. Um, so when you look at a composite certificate, its algorithm or OID specifically says, this is a composite of dilithium and RSA. And when you look at the key structure in the certificate, it's actually composed of two keys um, in, that, in that key field, in the private key field, uh, sorry, the public key field of that certificate. The, um, I think the advantage composite has is any relying party that's consuming a composite certificate is by definition using both of the keys. If you use a composite certificate, certificate to create a certificate a signature, you are using both of the keys at the same time to create this, the signature. Similarly, if you use a composite certificate to encrypt a piece of data, those keys are <coughs> combined in a crypt cryptographically strong way where in order to decrypt, you have to, have to use both keys. Um, so composite gives you that promise of every, every party consuming or using that certificate is using both of the keys and giving you potentially uh, security from both traditional and quantum safe uh, cryptographic algorithms. A little bit of an aside, one of the advantages or capabilities a composite scheme gives you is potentially the um, capability to rem remain compliant. Um, compliance regimes like PCI DSS or FIPS 140 are going to lag behind the state of the art of quantum safe. Um, and it's already established, for instance, that um, if one of the algorithms in a composite uh, certificate is FIPS validated, like RSA, then the outcome can claim to be FIPS. Uh, so in where we are right now, we don't have any <laughs> FIPS validation yet for NIST quantum safe algorithms. We know it's coming, um, but this is a mechanism that could potentially allow you to rem remain compliant and add quantum safe in situations where that compliance regime hasn't yet adopted um, PQC. There are a number of other hybrid certificate formats as well uh, as, as composite, and there, there's three I'm gonna dig into. 
These hybrid uh, constructions are, uh, are sort of trading the security promise that Composite makes, which is I'm guaranteeing that both keys are getting used all the time, for backwards compatibility. These hybrid mechanisms allow clients potentially to choose one key or another. Uh, and legacy clients, for instance, can use the key they understand, the RSA elliptic curve one, and newer clients can use um, the quantum safe key or perhaps both keys. Uh, I'm gonna, gonna dig into each of these three different mechanisms. Perhaps the default case, the, the simplest to understand from a design point of view is multiple certificates. You of course can issue a endpoint or an identity, multiple certificates, one from an existing traditional public key uh, CA and one from a new quantum safe um, CA. In this case, we've got an uh, identity that's been issued a or has an, an existing elliptic curve, ECDSA key, and a new the lithium um, SLDH, SLH, DH. <laughs> that's, it's actually a Sphinx plus there. SLH, DSA root, and a uh, the lithium intermediate CA and a the lithium endpoint. I think that the um, complexity that we're adding here, we're really multiplying the certificate lifecycle management challenge here where every entity has multiple certificates. Um, certificate lifecycle management is already one of the challenges that many of our customers face. Um, the other problem we get into here is potentially wanting to manage or link um, multiple certificates to a single identity. Uh, and there are some schemes that allow you to potentially point from one CA infrastructure to another, but you know, layers in some of the complexity in a multiple certificate design. Another hybrid mechanism uh, is called the alt public key. Um, used to be called Catalyst. Uh, this is a mechanism that is undergoing some standardization work already. Um, and it's fairly straightforward to understand, really. It puts the quantum safe key in a, in a non-critical V3 extension in the certificate. You can see on that right side picture there, there's an alt public key, which is the dilithium key and an alternate signature, which is the signature across the certificate using dilithium. And the um, sort of the public key and signature um, attributes of the certificate are RSA. And so this, this really lets a, perhaps is one of the most backwards compatible um, constructions, a legacy client's just gonna pick up the certificate that looks just like an RSA certificate, or it is an RSA certificate. It's gonna completely ignore the non-critical extension that has the, uh, uh, the lithium key in it. Um, I think one of the concerns with constructions like this, um, you know, you're potentially sending and, and paying the cost, bandwidth cost of, of post-quantum that you're sending to every endpoint, even if they don't understand it. Um, and there's no guarantee here. When you look at a, a system or an ecosystem where these kinds of certificates are deployed, really hard to understand um, how much quantum safe do I actually have? What clients are using the quantum safe pieces and what clients aren't? Uh, and the last mechanism I wanna talk about today, um, perhaps one of the most interesting uh, designs that I've seen go by around hybrid constructions, this is called Chameleon. Um, this is something that working on uh, standardization also at the IETF remains to be seen uh, how useful uh, this will be. It's a bit like that previous one, alt public key mechanism. In this case, instead of a extension that simply holds the quantum safe key, um, we've introduced the concept of a delta certificate descriptor. And the kind of cool thing about this delta descriptor, it lets you convert the certificate into two different formats, essentially. Um, the outer layer of the certificate is, could be the RSA layer. The inner layer, the delta certificate, could be the quantum safe layer. And you essentially can apply a transformation, apply those delta certificate descriptor to the certificate, turn it from an RSA certificate into a uh, quantum safe one. The opposite's also, of course, possible, where the outer certificate envelope essentially is the dilithium um, quantum safe specification, the inner one is the RSA. There's a couple of interesting advantages to this mechanism if you think about it. If the RSA is sitting in the inside in that delta certificate descriptor, as a server, I can apply the transformation, 
and reply to a legacy client simply with the RSA certificate. Um, so I don't have to pay any penalty for transmitting the, the larger post-quantum data set there. Um, and so that's sort of like a migration into quantum safe has that advantage if you stick the RSA in the inside. The opposite's also potentially possible. If you stick the post-quantum on the inside, it's sort of a migration out of a hybrid mechanism where at a certain point in time, I can simply take the inner piece as my dilithium certificate and throw away the RSA piece. And you know, once, once my ecosystem is fully transitioned, simply answer clients with my um, quantum safe certificate. So certainly appreciate the chance to speak to you today. Um, from my point of view, when I'm looking at post-quantum migrations, uh, it's undoubtedly a challenge for um, organizations that have deployed PKI. Uh, again, X509 and PKI are probably one of the most widely deployed pieces of security infrastructure across our, our digital lives. Um, I think we've, we're starting to zero in on some of the questions and requirements that organizations can ask themselves, can analyze their application or their ecosystem to identify you know, how easy or hard is this migration path going to be. Uh, you know, as an industry, we're working hard at developing these tools, these techniques um, and technology that will help uh, organizations along this migration path. We have some interesting technology that's already in development that's moving towards um, ratified RFCs and potentially being incorporated into some of the vertical specific protocols and messaging formats. Um, but I think the challenge as an industry as an, uh, that we have is, is to move from this sort of intimidating world of post-quantum where you have all of these different algorithms with different properties and you have all of these different hybrid mechanisms and transition uh, paths that organizations can take and really begin to develop this into a set of best practices or a set of recipes that uh, organizations can sort of easily follow. Um, I think it's, it's probably too much to ask every organization that has to make a move towards quantum safe to understand the nuance of all of these pieces and how they fit together. And it's really falls on people in this room uh, and online to help define those best practices and recipes that uh, allow organizations to make a smooth and orderly transition. Um, and not get lost in the details of all of this. So, um, love to take questions from the room, from, from online. Um, Thomas? Thank you, Greg. Are there any questions from the audience uh, in the room? So maybe let me start with the first question. You uh, um, started your talk uh, talking a little bit about scale deployment of uh, post-quantum cryptography, and later you came back to a similar topic with uh, ore composition in hybrid certificates, both to establish backwards uh, compatibility. But in such a scenario, you might be susceptible to downgrade attacks. Are there ways to mitigate uh, these kind of vulnerabilities or are downgrade attacks uh, inevitable uh, if you require backwards compatibility? Yeah, it, that's a, a great question. I think it's really useful to understand the distinction between a composite form where you are essentially guaranteeing, by definition, those composite forms are applying both traditional and quantum safe cryptography at the same time. And that gives you that security promise of protection from both attacks to new quantum algorithms and, um, and gets the safety from those, those uh, traditional RSA or elliptic curve mechanisms. The other hybrid formats I presented really are focused on that, that real life challenge of backwards compatibility. I've got legacy clients and I've got um, new and uh, updated clients and I have to live in that world for a period of time, I think for that period of time, you're facing this problem of downgrade attacks. So, you know, when Q day comes, um, you're gonna not want to be able to, you're gonna not want to support, you're gonna want to be able to turn off those, those hybrid mechanisms. And I, I think the nice piece of that though is that we have likely some time. Um, but you know, organizations are thinking about these, this trade-off, and you know, if if I'm extremely concerned about harvest now decrypt later, and I'm deploying quantum safe into an ecosystem or application, I have to think about: Am I willing to live with that 
um, that downgrade possibility or that legacy client who's handling sensitive data, I'm not protecting it from harvest now decrypt later until I turn off that traditional uh, public key crypto mechanism. Okay, thank you. So there's no easy solution to I this. I don't think there's uh, a magic trade -off. bullet that, yeah. that gives you protection for uh, you know, non-PQ aware uh, clients without um, exposing yourself to that. I was fearing that to be the case. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No, then please. Oh, there's one question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I will use the opportunity since the mic is here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, making an analogy with the very old days uh, when we had the password protected with uh, by saving the hash instead of the plain text password. And then we had the rainbow attack where we have a dictionary sure. of all hash uh, yeah, values. Do you think like not in the good days, but maybe a few years later, there will be some time when we probably have a database of all possible keys that we don't really need a quantum computer to break them, but they would be readily available for anyone to kind of go back into what kind of... Uh, a database of all possible keys. I, yeah, I think yeah. traditional crypto cryptography is built around the key space being so large yeah. that you know the every atom in the universe you'd need to store <laughs> every possible key, even in traditional public key crypto. Um, so I don't think that's a feasible threat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.